Lord, we ask for your help in this time as we gather together to worship you, to experience your presence, to enjoy fellowship with the family of God. Lord, we ask that you would help us. There are many things that cause distractions. Lord, there's many ways that we have a schizophrenic heart. And so, Lord, in this brief time that we have together, we would ask that you would help us to focus on the author and the perfecter of our faith, that we would look to you, Lord, that we'd recognize that uh, your grace that you have for us, the love you've displayed, Lord, the provision of giving us a Holy Spirit that is the one that is our comforter, our guide, the one that will teach us all things and remind us of everything. And so, Father, we want to lean in to all the provision you have for us this morning. We pray, Lord. We ask that you would forgive us, Lord, where we fall short. And Father, we, we confess. We, we are people, and in that, uh, Lord, sometimes we get frustrated Sometimes we get wounded, sometimes we are hurt, sometimes just the circumstances of life and what we see going on in the world and, and, and in the United States and all those things can cause turmoil and, and weariness and concern and out of that, Lord, it's no longer being led by the Spirit but by our feelings and our emotions and we hit the default and it's the flesh rather than the spirit that is leading us. And so, Father, forgive us for that. Lord, we are, we are leaky vessels as well. And we, we need a fresh filling of your Holy Spirit as you have instructed us to continually, constantly be filled with the Spirit of God. And so, Lord, I pray that now that you, in your generous way, would pour out your Spirit once again upon us to where our cup would overflow. Father, we pray, recognizing that there are people who are sick, or there are people who battle disease, or there are things that we, we don't know what to do but pray. But you have proven yourself faithful. And so, Lord, we pray for those, the infirmed, the sick, the diseased, Lord, knowing that there's nothing that is impossible for you. We pray, Lord, for those that are estranged in relationships, Lord, that you would put those back together. We ask, Father, that you would uh, establish this church once again as a, as a lighthouse to this community, that it would draw the people that you intend, Father, to advance the kingdom. Lord, may it be a blessing and be, be a blessing to one another and to this community and to the advancement of the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, have your way and will in our lives individually so that then it can be experienced corporately and that people would recognize us by our love and say those, those are Jesus' followers. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, church. Um, <clears throat> we are going to share communion together this morning. And as I prayed about that and thought about that, there's a, you know, different churches and even different churches within the Free Methodist uh, community do that a little bit different. And, and since I'm a little bit different, uh, I thought I would maybe do this a little bit different. So I think most of us know, uh, obviously, this is a, one of the only two sacraments that we celebrate. One is uh, communion and the other is baptism. And this was not, it was, it was not, you know, a denomination. It was not a pastor. It was not a religion's idea. This was God's idea. And Jesus instituted it as a new covenant in his blood. And I, I think we're very much aware of that. This is one of the few things that you see in scripture that is repeated and redundant because of the importance of it. You know, when, when 
Jesus says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, that, that's important. Hey, Ed, anyway, those things are important. And so this is repeated. We see it in the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, the Apostle Paul picks it up as well in Corinthians chapter 11. And so uh, we're familiar with that. Now, John, in John chapter 13, he doesn't focus so much on the elements as he kind of gives us the background. He, we, he kind of pulls back the curtain, so to speak, and we see the upper room. Matter of fact, he describes it as a large upper room. He talks about there should have been preparations and they didn't wash the feet, so Jesus you know, took, takes off his outer garment, wraps himself, takes on the form of a servant, and he washes the disciples' feet. That's all going on there. That's kind of how John looks at it. And then he talks about them being at the table, and while they're at the table, some of the things that are going to go on. So a little bit different. But I, I know, I was trying to think how many communions I've probably had in my life, and I, I'm not good with math, so I didn't go very far with that. But many of us have had a lot of them. And I know when I used to read my, my kids, their favorite bedtime story, they were so familiar with it that they could kind of, as a matter of fact, I couldn't cheat and try to condense it, you know. They, they knew, right? And I think sometimes we get that, we're so familiar with it. You know, you know what's coming uh, next, that it was kind of like my children, they, yeah, and they live happily ever after. And, and we know that this is symbolic of the death of our Lord and Savior. We recognize that, but, but he, he rises from the dead, right? He, we can rejoice in that. We kind of skipped on that. And, I, and so I don't think we really, many times, really take the time to comprehend, to just let the reality of this and bask in all that God has done for us and provided for us through, through this one ritual that we do quite often. And so I'm going to, in some ways we're going to be looking at a macro kind of view, the big picture, and then the micro view. And that's what a lot of times, and, and me included, a lot of times communion is basically centered on this. You know, we do a service and then we say, this is the body of our Lord Jesus Christ and this is the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. We get that, right? That's... That's kind of the micro, that's focusing, that's, that, that's pinpointing right on that. But I want to look a little bit at the, uh, the bigger picture. And so, obviously, we should have some scripture. Uh, so I'm going to read out of uh, 1 Corinthians, a few verses. But I'm going to tell us this story and talk about this story in the bigger picture through all the Gospels. So... Starting in chapter 11, verse 23, the Apostle Paul is telling the Corinthian church this, for I received from the Lord what I passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given it thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance in me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So one of the things I like to do, and the people here from Tenasket know, I, I like to just kind of ponder the scriptures. I like to pray through them. I like to put myself in the story because that's just I'm a, kind of a visual person and just looking at words on a page doesn't help me. So I like to get in and try to experience as much as I can from that. And one of the things I started thinking about this is, do we recognize here the love of God? Because Romans tells us that God demonstrated his love for us while we were sinners, Christ died for us. And that is what this obviously represents. But, but Isaiah 53 says that it was the Lord's will or God's will to crush him, Jesus. Think about that for a moment. 
It was God's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And then he explains why. So that he could make his life an offering for sin. When you talk to people, sometimes the way you see things portrayed and you, you hear questions, sometimes people approach this like the death of Jesus Christ was some kind of satanic scheme. Or maybe it was come out of the hatred and the envy and the jealousy of the religious leaders. But what we need to understand, this is God's plan of redemption for humanity. And although there are is human will, and there is satanic opposition. God is sovereign over all those things, and he, he is still in control of things in your life and in my life and in this whole redemptive plan for humanity. And just, just think about loving us enough to give his one and only son. As a matter of fact, Matthew chapter 3, when it says, this is my son after his baptism, I'm, I'm still a little... You know, I, I've been at it long enough. I went through the King James. The first Bible was given me was Revised Standard. Then, it, you know, it's NIV. So I, I, I'm, they're, they're all together. I'm all confused. But it says there that this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Not, it, it's just not a stepkid. This is just, the, this is not something that is not important to me. This is my one and only beloved And in in the Greek mentality, to say somebody was beloved is usually typically used only by parents that are saying, this is how I lavish my love on this child. I call him beloved. And he loved us enough that he would send his son. And so I, I got to thinking about that for a little while. And then I was thinking about Genesis chapter 2. The whole creation. And the Trinity had an official board meeting and somehow decided, let us make man in our own image. And can you imagine God rolling up his sleeves, getting down, in the dust and the dirt of the earth and perfectly creating and form, forming humans that would be bear his witness, that could enjoy his character, that could have reason, and breathed life into him. It cost God one deep breath and a handful of dirt to create us. It cost him his beloved, his only son, to redeem us. So we have the love of God, but we also have the obedience and the love of Jesus. Amen? I mean, think about that. We know the prophets say that he was a man of sorrow. He talks about himself as he's burdened down in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he's overwhelmed with sorrow to the very point of death. Now, I know in a context that primarily is probably understanding what he was about to face. The reality and the cruelty of who he is going to be handed over to, the understanding of what would take place on that cross, But as the perfect God-man, he, he experienced the same sort of sorrows that we experienced. His relative, John the Baptist, in prison and beheaded. One of his closer friends, Lazarus, died. Yes, he knew he was going to raise him from the dead. 
but grief nonetheless. He wept at the gravesite, right? Think about having an opposition of the very people that you come to save, and they rejected him. They almost stoned him in his own hometown. He knows his disciples are going to flee. He knows one of them that he washed the feet that night was his betrayer. He knew who his betrayer was. And with all that sorrow and with the way humanity treated him, he was obedient, as it says in Philippians chapter 2, even to death on a cross. I, 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 can't, I can't hardly wrap my mind around it. And if we look at this scene, a lot of times we forget what's behind the scenes. Because behind the scenes, the Bible tells us that already the religious leaders, and specifically Caiaphas, who was the high priest, uh, said, we got we to gotta put an end to this. And so they, they decided, they schemed, as a matter of fact, I put it, how, what, what they were going to do to get rid of Jesus. They wanted to kill him. But it says this, but not during the festival, not during the Passover, not during this period of time, because they were afraid because of the Jesus' popularity, it would cause too much commotion and there'd be riots and all that. And so more than likely what they had in mind, they were going to, after that, they get him alone someplace and they'd escor or escort him outside town or something and stone him to death. And so that's what they had in mind. And if you look at Matthew chapter 26, you know, Judas, he says, hey, I got an idea. And he sells him out for the 30 pieces of silver. Then it says he's going to wait for an opportune time to turn him over to be betrayed. Now, this was not a surprise to Jesus at all. If we were to begin, go to the beginning of Matthew chapter 26, not, he started explaining it there. He, he did in Matthew uh, chapter 20. And in and, and Matthew chapter 20, he, he gets a little more specific. He's not only going to be, be turned over, but I'm going to be turned over to the Gentiles. And so he's talking about, I'm going to be handed over to the Romans. So he knows he's going to be betrayed. He knows he's going to die. He tells them it's going to happen in a few days during Passover. Have you picked up on the conflict? Man's plan, the scheme of man is this is going to happen after Passover. We're in control. We're going to do it. God's plan, no, it's going to happen during Passover. And it reminded me of what Job said. I think, I think in chapter 42 he says, I know you can do all things or everything. No plan or purpose of yours can be thwarted. Friends, sometimes it seems like there's no plan, there's no purpose, things are out of control. But God is still there. He's still on the scene. He still knows how to pour grace into se seemingly impossible things and make good things out of it. And so be encouraged by that. And then Satan, as always, waits in the shadows. Just like Judas, he's waiting for his opportunity. And as we go to the upper room, if you're familiar with it, if you start reading, especially if you will read the synoptics and if you'll read all those and just kind of think for a moment, you'll see that because of this plot against Jesus, more than likely Jesus hadn't broadcast where he was going to be because he goes to Peter and John and says, I want you to prepare, go and prepare for us for Passover. We want to, I want to celebrate that with you. And they ask the question, where do we do that? Where? I don't know where. Where are we doing that? And he gives them instruction to see a certain man. And they go. And so now here we are at this upper room. 
and the foot washing ceremony has gone on. All the preliminary things, they're, they're eating a meal, and as customary during that time, they don't sit at the table. It's not a big long table like Da Vinci has it. But they would sit around and they would lean on their left side. And so this would be, if I was John, Jesus would be here. And they would sup. They would dip the bread. They'd break off the bread, dip it, and then they would eat it. It's... Uh, Obviously, this has been centered in... Has anybody, been, anybody gone through a Seder dinner? Yeah. So what they're celebrating really is the instructions from Exodus chapter 12. That is, that is their being reminded. I, I th- sometimes I wish as, as Christian in Christianity we had more standing stones. We had more, more times where we looked back and said, no, no, no that's where God met with us because he does meet with us but there would have been the lamb there that would remind them of the lamb that had to be slain and the blood that had to be shed so that they could dip the hyssop branches as instructed and put around the door so then when the judgment of God was coming that it would pass over, right? That, that was the whole meaning of that. And so they would have the lamb. They would have the bitter herbs, reminding them of the bondage and the bitterness of slavery and the bondage that they, they would go through. And they would have the cups. And all these cups have different meanings there. And obviously, there's the unleavened bread which would remind them that they had to leave in haste. There's no time for the yeast or for the bread to rise. And so they had all these elements reminding them of the past, that God had been faithful in the past. God had delivered them. And the cups were a reminder in Exodus 6 of some of the promises that God said, that's what I'm going to do. You, I will deliver you and you will be my people. And so that's all those cups remind them the same thing. It was a cup of sanctification or separation that reminded them this is not just an ordinary meal for them either. This was a special meal. They had the cup of salvation or deliverance. They had the cup of redemption or salvation. And the final cup was a cup of hope that you, I will be your God and you will be my people. So this this is the setting, and they're all there doing that. And it, we, we understand hospitality a little bit. And most of us understand that when we have a meal with somebody, generally it's somebody that we care about, right? Well, in the Eastern culture especially, if somebody asked you to come and break bread with them, that was a... a a significant act saying that you, you are my friend and I, and I trust you with that. And so they're laying there, they're reclining, and we're told that it's, it, the disciple that Jesus loved, which John was on one side, and we don't know the seating arrangement for the others. But we do know that when Jesus says that one of you is going to betray me and they start asking and he explains that, it's very interesting. They didn't know. Did you you notice what Judas said? Surely not I, Lord. It reminds me, I, I got in a fender bender one time when I was a teenager and I thought I could get away with not telling anybody. And so I saw my dad out there looking at that dent. And I said, you know what happened there? All I wanted to know if he knew who did it. Judas knew what he had done.
And he tells his disciples, the one who dips his, cu- his bread w- with me, and he hands him, he is close enough, whether he's next or, or just, just down the table or not, he hands him the morsel, and Judas takes it, and Jesus says, go and do what you must do, and do it quickly. And if you read it, it says, at that moment, G- Satan entered him. Now, whether, whether or not the enter means that some kind of a possession or oppression, it definitely the temptation was there then, okay, I'm getting out of here. And then Jesus continues to have the intimate dinner that we're going to share here. It just gives me a little different pause when I think about all that was going on there and the dynamics, the human nature, the spiritual oppression, the love and the obedience, all that was a mix there. But I know many times when we come to the table here, there's questions. So I'm, I'm going to try to answer a few of those in, very simply um, in the who, what, why kind of way and the who is this. This is... Biblically, this is a believer's table. Those of us who are placed our faith in Christ. And so then in our belief system, that doesn't, that doesn't limit you to a certain age. It means that if, like with a child, can articulate to his parents... No, I put my place in Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, and I want to take communion, then we allow them to do that. We practice an open communion table, which means that, like we have some new friends here, Shane and Richard in the back, and if they, if they want to participate in, in that, then they can do that. You don't have to be a member of the church, because what we're not participating in this morning is not the church we're an organization. We're participating in the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the what? It is a sacrament. And even the sacrament itself is really kind of a, we're, we're renewing an oath in a sense. It's a sacrament. Obviously it is the cup and the bread. Uh, for us, you're, you're, we, we have gluten-free as the unleavened bread that we're using today. The, the, the cup is, is a grape juice. It's not an actual wine. Uh, but let me just say this. When, when Jesus talks about it, he says, I, you know, I won't drink of the fruit of the vine again. There... there there's absolutely no instructions that says that this, this was some sort of fermented wine. Now, that was a culture, and very, very well could have been, and, and in that culture, they, they, they took the wine and they would dilute it anyway. But to be sensitive, for a lot of reasons, for people who maybe don't, that struggle with those kind of things, we just use wine. So it's unleavened bread, gluten-free even, and that's what it's represents. The where uh, typically where the followers of Christ gather. It's generally in a service like this, but it can be, uh, you know, sometimes on a Christmas Eve service or there's other times as when you see that. Now, as, as well, I've been called when people have been in hospice, I've had some of the uh, people in my church say, you know, dad's been told he's probably not going to make it through the week and he would like to have one last communion but he's too too ill obviously he's on hospice he's home and so I go to their home we'd have communion that that is approved and, and acknowledged but it's not the norm because you know what communion means it means koinonia and koinonia is intimate fellowship with one another it's it's something that we do together that we share together that we focus together on these things, not all the other stuff. And so that is what's typical. When do we do it? Well, John Wesley said it's the duty of every Christian to participate in the Lord's Supper at every opportunity. 
But here, and like many churches, it is done just basically once a month. There again, there's no biblical instructions that says it has to be done so many times or anything. We're just to remember why we're doing it. Uh, when I was in Tushan, the, they didn't have a free Methodist church there. I went to the Nazarene church, and they would, they would practice communion this way once a month, but they had a communion table at the back every week, and they had people in the back that would serve and pray and pray with the people if they wanted prayer and all that sort of thing. And so that's how they did that. And so there, there's, there's no biblical instruction that limits us and constrains us to those things. It's just more out of the, out of the culture of the individual church. And so, and we do this because we're instructed to. It was, Jesus commanded us to do that. Why? Because it proclaims the Lord's death until he returns. And ultimately, uh, whether you realize it or not, it is a testimony. Because what you're saying is, you know, I'm in. Jesus died for me personally. This is, this is a grace for my benefit that I'm now going to take opportunity to avail myself to. And so publicly, I'm doing that. And so... I just want you to remember this. We, we don't come to the table based on our religion or what we've done, but on what Christ has accomplished. That's what this is about. We come out of, out of love. We come, in a sense, out of obedience because that's what we are instructed to do. But before I have the couples come up and disperse this I just, I just want to say a couple of things I as you do this I want to take a little bit of time for us just to ponder this but I want you to remember that this is significant it's routine I know it's not your first rodeo I understand but in doing this recognize back in the big picture this was God's plan. This was his purpose. And his purposes, whatever his purposes are, will not be thwarted. Secondly, reflect. It's a good time, you know, the Bible says to examine yourself. Reflect on your relationship with one another. We're not to let the root of bitterness take root in our hearts. We're not to be accuser of the brethren. That job's already taken. And I found in my life that it takes absolutely no longer for me to accuse a brother than it did for me to pray for the brother. I can pray anywhere, anytime, very quickly. And so reflect on that. How's your koinonia? Your love for the family of God, not just in this, not just here, but the extended family. They maybe worship a little different down there. They're in the happy clappy church or they're in the very solemn church what you know what because I read you're going to spend an eternity with those knuckleheads <laughs> so so we need to really start looking bigger at a bigger picture here the kingdom of God and not our kingdom but God's kingdom what he wants to do and how he wants to advance that because we're participating in the same Lord and Savior for all And then repent. You know, this examination really isn't, I, I don't think it was ever, even the Apostle Paul, I don't think his instructions there is to disqualify us. It's for us to say, wait a minute. 
I'm not, I'm not really walking the walk that I said I was going to walk. It, it's, t- it's time for me to say, God, forgive me for my attitude. It's the time that what God wants to do, and he's very good at it, he'll recalibrate your heart. Where you're just off a few degrees because you're angry or you're hurt or you're frustrated or you don't like the way things are, whether it's in church or it's in the world, he says, I got that. Let me, let me make some adjustments. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins if we confess them. And then in a little while, we're going to rejoice because we're going to sing the doxology as we rejoice about all the blessings, all the good things that God has done for us. So I'm going to pray over these elements and ask them to come up and they'll disperse them to you and you can hang on to them and we'll we'll take them together if you allow me. Pray with me, would you? Father, I, I give thanks for your body and your blood. Lord, I'm very, very mindful of what this cost and what it means. And Lord, you absolutely do not need my blessing or my prayer over these elements for you are here. But, Lord, I do ask your blessing upon them that they would, as they're dispersed, Father, that it would be the balm of Gilead, that it would bring healing and restoration, forgiveness. That we remember even as Jesus is obedient unto death that there's a call on our lives to pick up our cross and follow you, which is also a form of sacrifice And so, Lord, what are you calling us to? How are we to sacrifice? And, Lord, once again, we thank you for the love of God. And we ask, Father, that as you pour that once again fresh into our hearts, Lord, that we could love our Lord with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, so that, Father, in order that we could love our neighbor as ourselves. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.